Hey everybody, welcome. Um, I wanted to uh, discuss about how duality in linear programming relates to this observation that in some sense, finding an optimal solution to a linear programming problem is really no harder than just finding any feasible solution, okay? So this is something that I've said before, finding an optimal solution is really no harder than finding any solution. Let me re remind you of our first two explanations of that fact. And then I'll give you a third explanation, probably the most elegant one using duality. So our first explanation was um, if you had an oracle that could give you a feasible solution, you could use that oracle to find a, a solution that's as close to optimal as you want. So pretend you, you call that oracle and say, hey, find me any feasible solution. It gives you a feasible solution. Then what you do is you add in another constraint saying, well, I want to do better than that. I should say, we're, um, we're trying to maximize in, in this direction that way, okay? And so now we add in this new constraint, this red constraint. I, I need to be on you know, the top left side of the red line. And so I have a new smaller feasible region Okay, and so I ask my Oracle again, give me um, any feasible solution. It does. And then I say, well, okay, I wanna do better. So add in a new constraint, forcing me to do better. And eventually you zero in on, you know, as close as you want to the actual solution. Um, if you end up adding a constraint that's too ambitious, then your oracle says, wait, there's no feasible solution. So then you just have to back up. All right? So this is one sense in which if you can find a feasible solution, you can find an optimal solution to any linear programming problem. A second explanation of this, I don't know how much I emphasized this at, this, at the time, is really just that the simplex method behaves no differently in phase one versus phase two. Phase two of the simplex method is what we've practiced the most. You have a vertex, you have a basic feasible solution, and then you're pivoting to find an optimal vertex. Okay. Phase one is just finding that first basic feasible solution. Okay. In some problems, when you have one slack variable for every equation, finding a basic feasible solution is trivial. But in other problems, such as this one drawn here, it's not so obvious to find a, a basic feasible solution, right? I can't just plug in some of my variables to be zero and find a, a basic feasible solution. Um, by I, you can maybe see some uh, basic feasible solutions, but if I had 100 variables and 100 constraints, you know, it's not easy. So, how did we do phase one of the simplex method? How did we find a basic feasible solution? We added in these auxiliary variables, um, x4 and x5, okay? So I'm changing the equation by adding in x4 and similarly for x5. But I also just completely forget about this optimization function and my new optimization function is I just want x4 and x5 to be as close to zero as possible. I'm trying to maximize this uh, non-negative number. So I'm trying to get x4 and x5 to be zero if I can. And so this problem, you know, you can, um, you can uh, clearly run the simplex method. Start where x1, x2, and x3 are all zero. Start with x4 equal to four and x5 equal to two, run the simplex method. And then if you obtain an optimum, which is zero, then you found a feasible solution, basic feasible solution to the problem you actually care about, okay? But if this maximum here is achieved in the auxiliary problem with x4 and x5 not both zero, then you've proven that there's no feasible solution. And so your original problem was infeasible. 
Okay, so that's another explanation where, I mean, finding an optimal solution is done using the simplex method, which is really how you find any basic feasible solution to start with in phase one using this auxiliary problem. Questions on that? Yeah, did you say um, that both x4 and x5 need to be zero or just the sort of negative sum? Both of them need to be zero. So um, I should write here, I'm missing it. Oh no, I need to go back and correct my notes. I should write here that x4 and x5 are both uh, non-negative, right? So you need both of them to be zero in order to, um, to have uh, a, a, a basic feasible solution to this problem. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, and, and yeah, and then if, if the maximum is obtained at negative 17, then that's telling you that it's impossible for both x4 and x5 to be zero, which is the same thing as saying it's impossible for these constraints to be satisfied. Other questions? Okay, yeah. So here's a picture of a random polytope where it's not so easy to find a, a feasible solution, right? Zero, zero, zero is not feasible. Um, but in some, sex, in some sense, you use the simplex method to find your starting basic feasible solution and then you use the same simplex to, to optimize it, the same simplex method to optim optimize it. Neither phase one nor phase two are, are um, any harder than the other. Okay, so here's our third new explanation for why optimizing a linear program is really no harder than finding any feasible solution. And it relies on duality. So I've, written up here a uh, linear programming problem called the primal problem. And then it's dual becomes B transpose Y. We're trying to minimize that subject to A transpose Y as at least C and the variables Y are not negative. Weak duality tells us that the maximization, the thing we're trying to maximize in the, in the primal problem is always bounded from above by the thing we're trying to minimize in the dual. So here's our primal problem. This is the problem that we're trying to optimize, okay? I'm gonna show you how optimizing this problem is really just the same as finding any feasible solution to a different problem. And here's our different problem. Forget about the optimization. It doesn't really matter what we're trying to optimize here because it's gonna turn out there's only gonna be one feasible solution and that one feasible solution is gonna be the optimum of this one, okay? So we keep the constraint AX at most B. We keep the constraint X is non-negative. We're gonna add in new variables, Y, okay? So um, we had X1 up through XN and now we have new variables, y1 up through ym. I'm going to add in this constraint from the dual. And I'm also gonna add in the non-negativity constraint from the dual. And then finally, I'm gonna add in the weak duality inequality, but in the opposite direction. So this is my new problem where any feasible solution to this new problem is actually finding an optimal solution to the original problem. So if I satisfy the uh, primal constraints, and if I satisfy the, the dual constraints, then I know weak duality holds, okay? So since I satisfy the primal and the dual constraints, I know I have this weak duality. Okay, and now I've added another constraint 
weak duality, but in the opposite direction. I've added that right here. Okay. So now I have C transpose X is at most B transpose Y. That's just implied by weak duality. And I've sort of artificially added in that constraint in the opposite direction. Okay. So now if I, if I find a feasible solution to this problem, that means that C transpose X is equal to B transpose Y, which by strong duality, you know, means I've, I've maximized this problem. Okay. So essentially I'm taking my original program, I'm adding in more variables so that I can have both the program and its dual sort of in the, in the same problem. And then I add weak duality in, except I flip the order of, in, of the inequality. So a feasible solution here has to satisfy C transpose X equals B transpose Y, which means by strong duality, we've optimized the original problem. So finding an optimum here is the same as finding a feasible solution. Questions about that? Sort of a slick argument. It's a little, little uh, bit of a mind warp because there's a lot of variables going on. But, uh, it's a cool idea. All right, thanks. <laughs>